Hi, welcome to our meeting service. It is for uh, First Kings chapters four through seven. We're going to cover quite a bit of ground. They're all kind of connected. And so if you'll join me in this, we just continue to pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings of your word. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of reading it, studying it, and looking into it. And just be with us as we study it today in Jesus. Um, so we're in 1 Kings 4. So we started 1 Kings with the kind of end of the life of David and then uh, bringing uh, Solomon up to be the new king. And then last week we had the instances where he asked for wisdom and God gave it to him. And that wisdom was seen in the handling of the two women and the dispute over the child. And his idea was, I cut this baby in two, the real mother would certainly step up to, to protect it, and she did. And so this brings us to uh, chapter four. Now, because of his wisdom in that situation, the Bible says that um, people really begin to accept him as king and really begin to see his wisdom shining through. And in chapter four, so King Solomon was king over all Israel, north and south. Not have the divided kingdom until after Solomon is, is king towards the end of the so that in the coming weeks. But right now, things are looking pretty good. He is the king. He has uh, got the people on his side. His wisdom has been shared. Um, and in these four chapters, not four verses, but these four chapters, four, five, six, and seven, we see him uh, put around him his inner circle. We see him start to do the work God's called him to do. And here is this, the, what this whole uh, kind of midweek study is about. We all have a place in the ministry of God. We all have a place you know, some apostles, some teachers, some pastors, some evangelists, and we have that list, and, and we have certain, you know, the, the Bible uses the word gifts, so we'll use that word gifts, um, certain uh, desires of the heart, certain ministries that are more suited for us than others, and so um, we see at the beginning that he begins to surround himself with uh, men and women of God. It says, and these were his officials, verse two, Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest, uh, Eliorah and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, the scribes, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army, Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers, verse six, Ahashar, over the household of Adoran and the son of Abba, over the labor force. And so he surrounds himself with men that, that he can use in the church, in the body. It would be the pastor surrounding himself with good deacons, faithful men, as uh, Acts 6 tells us to, to put together. Um, and you're part of that. You know, where do you fit in? Some of these men, they had different rules. And they were leaders, but then they had men under them. And we're all in, in different realms. I, I, what really struck me with these first six verses is um, verse four. It says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army, Zadok and Abiathar, the priest. Now, if you remember, um, he sends Abiathar out because Abiathar actually uh, kind of uh, went against David, his father, and, and joined forces with the enemy. And so his punishment was to be exiled. But he's still a priest. He's not doing the work of the priest. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And it just reminded me of the verse in Peter where we are that royal priesthood. And even though I may be not equipped for God's work because of certain things, or maybe there's a temporary time where I just need to work on other things step away from minister work at times. Uh, even though that could happen, hopefully it doesn't. Um, 
My salvation is secure. My priesthood is secure. My place in Christ, no one will put me on the Father's hand. And it's interesting to see Abiathar is still in that list, um, even though he's not being used at this time. And so I, I thought that was encouraging. Uh, you want faithful men around you. The Bible says this. Proverbs 25, 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of the joint. And so uh, Solomon surrounds himself with the people that, that he can trust. And, and verse 7, he says he has 12 governors all over Israel that provided food for the king and the household. Uh, these are the names. I thought and verse 8 is interesting. Ben Hur, I have heard that name this isn't that been her, but it is probably where they got the name from. And it lists these 12 governors over these 12 regions to supply food. And this is basically um, an amazing little um, um, decently in an ordered government that Solomon, through his wisdom, is able to set up. And um, the best government is an orderly government. And so we see that God tells us to do everything decently and in order. Not everybody does this. Um, and so you see verse 11, there's been a day half, verse 12, may and not. It got, goes through and talks about what they're put over, what they read. Um, and then verse 19, give ear the son of Uri in the land of Gilead, the country of Sihon. And so they're all kind of given there. Uh, and I look at verse 7. It says, Solomon had 12 governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provision for one month. Um, so it's kind of a one twelfth. Um, and this was kind of the taxes that, that the people would give one twelfth of their food. And that way things could be supplied and take care of. You know, think we would better issue with a flat tax, probably 10%. Little tie would work, uh, but decently in an order. Verse 20 Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sands of the sea. Look at the beautiful blessings of God. Eating and drinking rejoices. And Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river of the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon. Solomon's provision for one day was 34 cores of fine flour, 10 fatted ox, 20 oxen of the pastures, 100 sheep, deer, and gazelles. He had dominion over the regions of the sides of the river of Atipsha, even in Gaza, namely over all the kings of the side. Verse 25, and Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba. Uh, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. What a blessing. Verse 27. And these governors, each man in his month, uh, provided food for the King Solomon, for all who came to King Solomon's table. There was no lack in his soul. So there was material blessings. And, and maybe he accumulated too much. There's verses about kings not accumulating a lot of postseason. We do see that Solomon did have a little bit of, wasn't a perfect guy. Um, but you know, every good and perfect thing comes from a man. And there was a time when this one nation and the God was so blessed. We were feeding the world. Uh, but now through droughts and, you know, uh, I think the world might blame on global warming. Might possibly be the fact that our nation has turned away from God and all of a sudden we're in a drought, but we refused to look inside like, like it is the sins of the world or, or turning away from God that could have caused it. Because Solomon has things back on track and the blessings come. The blessings come. Um, so there's increase. Look at verses uh, 29. It says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of the men of the East. Verse 31, he was wiser than all the men, than Ethan, Ezra, Darda, the sons of Mahal. Verse 32, he spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar of Lebanon. He spoke of the animals and of the birds. 
all men of the nations and all kings of the earth who had heard his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So I want you to see what's happening in this chapter. Very briefly. Here's a man asking God for wisdom. God gives him this gift of wisdom. And then God says, because you didn't ask for riches and enemy and all those other things. I'm going to give them to you anyway. And we see a nation that is organized, that is offering, and, and, and that is being provided for, and that is being protected. And this is all that God wants for you. It's what he wants for our nation, what he wants for this world. But this world refuses to follow him refuses and we see at the end of this chapter that there's this this amazing increase in knowledge there's answers to a lot of issues in the world today those answers come from god and what god does is he he increases the wisdom of man uh daniel says this uh in the book of daniel he says you shall daniel shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end many shall run to and fro in knowledge shall increase so god can do an amazing thing with man's knowledge he can increase it but we have to give him more you know we as a nation what a what a blessed nation we were and, and the knowledge that increased you know in 1903 the wright brothers flew their plane at Keon. 1903 that means 1900 years since Jesus, nobody was flying. All of a sudden, they flew. 1903, 1900 years from the time of Christ. Wow. 1969, we were on the moon. That's amazing. You think about it 66 years, how knowledge increased. Uh, many would see that as a sign of the end times, knowledge increasing. Look at what phones do, look at technology. And we see in the book of Revelation that the Antichrist is going to use a lot of this technology. My point is this. This knowledge that, that Solomon had, all of the things in chapter 4 were gifts given to him because he humbly went to God and pleaded with him. It was, and God blessed him with so many others. Man, if we would just as a country my people call by my name. This nation would turn to God and say, God, we don't know what we're doing. We're a mess. We need your help. And you see the rains come, knowledge increase, blessings flow. So, um, chapter five is a very short little chapter. And but there's one uh, very important part. It's 18 verses. And basically, it is God providing the materials needed to build the temple. Hiram, this, remember, this is the main task of Solomon, is to build this grand temple. Remember, his father, David, could not build it because he had blood on his hands. So Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that he had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram always loved David. David had a good relationship with those Entire and Solomon said, You know, my father David could not build a house in the name of the Lord because of the wars which he were fought against him on every side. But now, verse 4, the Lord God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adver adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord. That's what we want to look at. He's not going to say, I want to build a house for God. He says, I want to build a house for the name of the Lord. And the Bible teaches very clearly, um, Jesus says this, that, that the earth is God's footstool. That he's not a God that, that can fit into a temple. They that worship him is worshiping in spirit and in truth. And he says, look, at, if you think a building can contain God, you're wrong. And Solomon seems to get this. It's a house for the name of the Lord. He doesn't look at it as a house where God is going to be. It'll become some superstitious building. Like Martin's and other things. I really like that, that, that our church is a church for the name of the Lord to be preached, to be worshipped, to be praised, to be prayed to. It's just a building. That's the building. Um, 
Verse 7, when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced. Blessed be the Lord this day, for he's given David a wise son. And he said, look at, I've considered the message which was sent to me, and I'll do everything you desire. And so Hiram, verse 10, gives him cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. Verse 18, so Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the so verse 13 says Solomon raised the labor force out of Israel, and he used the wind, wisdom of Hiram, his knowledge of trees, his knowledge of quarry, and his uh, ownership of these things. And God provided everything he needed to begin the building of this marvelous, amazing temple. God will provide. He'll provide. If God has a, a task for us to do, he'll provide the finances to do the task, and the laborers to get it done. It's a blessing. It's an amazing thing that God does. Still does it today. Um, chapter six, um, the building gets done. Came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth month of Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build this house finally. They get to this promised land and finally are able to start building this amazing, glorious temple in the name of God. And this goes on to talk about, verse 2, the house which Solomon built for the Lord. Its length was 60 cubits. Its width 20. Verse 3 talks about the vestibule. Verse 4 talks about the windows, the wall of the temple. Verse 6, the, the lowest chambers. Verse 8, the doorway. Uh, verse 11, then the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this temple, which you're building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep my commandments and walk in them, then I'll perform my word with you, which I spoke to David. It's a pretty amazing thing. He says, look it, this is a building. And God says, it's, I want to help you build it. But it's more important. You know, the Bible says at first, uh, Samuel 15, 22, God said through Samuel to uh, King Saul, obedience to obey God is better than sacrifice. And this sacrifice, this building, as beautiful as it's going to be. And what's interesting, when they built the second temple after this one was destroyed, they were disappointed in how it looks. And Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, whatever, they tell the people, you know, it's not the building. It's the presence of God on the earth. Uh, and that's what God says concerning this. Look at verse 13. I will dwell among you, the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people. If you do what? Execute my judgments, keep my commandments, perform the word which I spoke of you. That's all we're supposed to be doing today. And the blessings would come back to this nation. And there's, there's a slight little turn. It, it feels like. I don't know how this is all going to end out, but but it feels like there's a turn that the things are getting bad enough. That people are saying, oh, man, we miss God. We miss the way it used to be. So we pray. Uh, so verse 14, Solomon built the temple and he finished it. And this chapter goes on to talk about the walls, verse 16, the room, how big it was. Verse 21, the inner, or verse 20, the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long. Verse 21, it was overlaid with pure gold. Verse 22, the whole temple was overlaid with gold. What a building it was. Verse 23, the inside the inner sanct uh, sanctuary he made with two cherubim of olive wood. He goes on, and you can read the details of it. Verse 29, he carved the walls of the temple all around with the inner sanctuary, the floor of the temple, the entrance. Uh, the, you can actually, there's a, there's couple of, some aren't great, but a couple of uh, good YouTube videos on, on what it may have looked like. If you take a look at the two or three doors of, of this amazing building. Verse uh, 36, it says he built the inner court with three rows of hewn stone. Verse 37, and in the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Zib. And in the 11th year, in the month of Buell, which is the eighth month, the house was finished. Its details according to all that its plans. So it was seven years. It took seven years. 
They got it done, but they had those instructions from God. This building is not where my blessings come from. It comes from obeying the word that I tell you. If you do this, man, you're going to see blessings. That's important. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. So in chapter 7, the work on the inside is now going to get done. The building's done, but there are some um, uh, furnishings to do. And to do this, it's going to take a lot of different people with different skills. And this is the lesson of the day. You really go back to chapter four. It's surrounding yourself with good people and increasing in wisdom because you're obedient to God. And the Bible talks about Psalm 119.99, I have more understanding than all my teachers. And that comes from your testimonies being my meditation. So if you meditate on God's word, wisdom comes. All right. Uh, chapter 5, it's a house for the name of the Lord. And God supplied everything they needed. Verse 6, it's about verse 12. Walk in my statutes and execute my judgments. Now, how beautiful this building is. Not obedient, it's just a building. And so, chapter seven, high, the king of Solomon uh, took 13 years to build his own house. So, he finished all of his house. Now, some people make a, a deal about the fact that there were seven years to build the temple and 13 years to build his house. And they, they tend to go negative that he spent too much time on himself. Um, maybe there's there's not a scripture to say that, um, but it, when I look at it, people worked on that house. It was priority his house. It probably took longer, maybe because he just worked on it by himself. He also built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits. It was paneled. There was a windows, and it gives a, a little bit of the information. Um, verse 13: King Solomon sent and brought. Hiram from Tyre. He was the son of the widow from the tribe of Naphtali. He was a bronze worker. He was filled with wisdom and understanding and the skill of bronze. And he made bronze pillars for the temple. Uh, verse 27, he also made 10 carts of bronze. And every cart had four bronze wheels, verse 30 said. And so now we see the very details of the carts and the labors and all of the things that were going to go inside and then the furnishings of the temple. And verse 51 says this, so all the work that King Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold furnishings. He put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. So all these chapters together uh, form a thought that is simply this. We have work to do. We have tasks to do. Solomon gets a lot of the glory and credit, and as well he should. God gave him this gift of wisdom. But even so, he humbly surrounded himself with people who would organize. He did everything decently in all. People contributed both financially and materialistically. People were giving wisdom by God. Um, they were working on a house that was for the name of the Lord. And they were doing it for God. And God blessed them materially. All the materials they needed to build this thing. Not only that, but God needed workers. He needed people who knew how to do bronze, how to, to carve wood. He knew how to, to lay down the wood. He knew people who knew how to cut down trees. And that's you. What is it? What is the work that we're to do? Um, and it's not finished. Um, I was reading the other day, and I've shared this a couple of times, but it was really a super blessing. I was reading Nehemiah chapter 8. And always trying to evaluate 
what I'm doing, how I'm doing it in my classroom and in the church. In Nehemiah chapter 8, I was just reading verses about the Levites. And I know I've read these verses before, but it just really had an impact on me. And it says this uh, in, in Nehemiah uh, chapter 8, um, verse 7. He's talking to the Levites, and it says the Levites helped the people understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So he's talking to these people, and including the Levites, says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to teach the people the law. Now that we're back, and this, this new temple's been built, it's very similar to the time of Solomon. He says, I want you to teach the people the law. So verse 8. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. When I read that, I thought, well, that's, I'm not a bronze worker, can't lay gold, but that's what I can do. I can study, read, educate myself so that I have the ability to read distinctly from this book, from this Bible. That's how we, why we do it verse by verse, to read distinctly from the book. And then to help people make sense of it and to help people understand. The Bible says, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. We're not done yet. We've got work to do. We've got work to do at Bible Christian Church. We've got work to do at Stonewall. We've got work to do in your community. What's the work I would have you to do? It takes a lot of people. <clears throat> Paul says, brethren, I don't count myself to apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal, to the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, you know what? I'm going to keep pressing forward. Not worry about the past. That's what God wanted these men to do and women to do in the work of God. So I'll leave you with this. God says, 1 Kings 6, concerning the temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep my commandments and walk in them, I'll perform my word with you, which I spoke to David, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my name. It's not about the building. It's about the work we do for God and our obedience to his word. That's what we do. Obedience is so much better than sacrifice. Heavenly Father, bless our time today. Bless these chapters in Jesus' name. Thanks for walking through these with me. I hope I didn't go too fast, but it's a general overview. Uh, someday on a, on a morning, we do a more detailed one. Uh, but I hope uh, you got a little bit out of this, this little meeting today. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.